Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this uh, workshop. Uh, and the only thing is that I am not an expert in archiving, not, not at all, actually. I'm a professor in musicology, and um, I will present here a, s a perspective from the point of view of producing sounds and uh, how to do that uh, in order to, to archive it. Um, so, is this working? Yeah, so may maybe my statement uh, will, be, will be bold. So we heard up to now that the digitalization is actually a good practice. But I would like to discuss a little bit about uh, the following equation. The ideal heritage minus the good practice conservation equals what is between your ears. And what is between your ears is context. In other words, ideal heritage equals context plus good practice conservation. And um, so I will focus a lot on this context issue. Okay, and this I think relates to philology, which is dealing with the historical development of recordings and also the, the context in which these uh, recordings uh, happen. And I will talk first about um, the institute uh, of which I am the director is uh, was actually um, a production studio for electroacoustic music, so we, we have to deal with that uh, heritage. Uh, but as you will see, we don't do that anymore, music production, we are in, in research. And so the question is how to deal with the conservation of that, and uh, the question I am struggling with now is how to deal with the things that we produce today, which are of a different order than just audio uh, recordings. Let me first introduce uh, uh, the Institute and a little bit of that context information that people need in order to make sense of uh, an audio signal. This was, very, this was very striking a few years ago. We celebrated the 50th anniversary of our Institute and we produced uh, a disc, an, L an LP, together with... with uh, CDs and photos and texts, and this was sold out immediately, whereas we have a, um, a large archive and basically nobody is actually uh, interested in it. But if you, if, you provide, if you provide context, people get interested in it. So, so, so the audio recording as such does not mean uh, anything for most of the people, especially not uh, with this kind of uh, music that we are dealing with here. So um, <clears throat> this electronic uh, music studio, like so many studios in, in Europe, was uh, founded after uh, the, the, world, the World War in the 60s, and it was linked with the National Broadcasting uh, Company. And it uh, finished basically in, in uh, 86, 87, where the whole thing was transferred to, to the university. The contract with the broadcasting company was broken and so on. And from that time on, we became a research institute with different goals. But just to show you some, some context of, of that those times, this is uh, Professor Wölsteke, who started actually with, uh, with this uh, institute. Um, okay. So this is very similar to what, what uh, happened in, in Paris, Köln, Utrecht, uh, Milan, many, many different places, Stockholm, many different places uh, everywhere in, in Europe. Uh, there were three pillars of that, technological innovation, artistic production, and scientific research. <clears throat> so at the time, they also built their own uh, equipment. And we had um, a strong artistic um, production. We also, there, were also, there was an ensemble related also to the institute. 
uh, <coughs> they produced uh, meetings, workshops, conferences, uh, publications, and one of uh, them happened in, in 64, the International Colloquium on Electronisch, <coughs> Electronics and Media in, in Music, with speakers like uh, Xenakis, uh, König, uh, Pietro Grossi, one of the pioneers here in, in Italy of electroacoustic music, uh, Schaeffer, Karl Huyvarts, and so on. They, they were all there, and it, it has been uh, documented also. Uh, I don't know if this works, this audio. just to give you an idea how it and <clears throat> the music of that time and in 66 uh, the institute was uh, transferred to the musicology department with uh, Jan Brooks uh, who was uh, my former uh, teacher and mentor and then uh, composers like uh, Louis de Meester were still working there he produced a lot of um, uh, music for for theater companies, just to get an impression. Karl Huyvaerts may be well known because he was one of the founders of uh, serialism. Uh, and I have here his uh, sonata for two pianos. <laughs> actually 1951, before the Institute <coughs> started. Then uh, Hutals is another uh, composer. Um, Hermann Sabe was also a professor in musicology. He was also a cellist. And together, so they, they, they realized quite some output. Uh, foreign compo composers uh, that came to the Institute, uh, Helmut Lachenmann was actually the first, uh, the first one. There are <coughs> many others. Uh, um, so now we are confronted with, um, with an archive. Um, so yes, we have about um, four, 470 compositions, uh, which you can compare it with what other studios uh, produced, uh, Stockholm which, uh, produced even more in Paris, uh, but it's similar to what happened in Utrecht uh, uh, at the time. Um, we have about a thousand uh, tapes, but also LPs and CDs and uh, <coughs> uh, letters and all other kind of stuff. Concerts were produced, and books, LPs, conferences. We also have <coughs> equipment. Here we have a, an old uh, Sinti 100, uh, which is still um, working. Now people have connected it digitally with, with laptops and we are actually uh, playing concerts uh, with it. it. It can be connected to acoustical instruments even. It's a very nice uh, instrument and it stood there in, in our studio for 25 years and nobody was interested in it, in it. and certainly since a couple of years uh, there is a huge interest from young people to see how this works and how this can be connected with the new digital uh, equipment. We also transferred uh, some of our old equipment to the Music Instruments Museum in Brussels where you, you can see let's say a setup 
of our uh, studio. And currently we are working on the digitalization of our uh, tape archive. Um, and maybe this is interesting to, to mention because we did actually a first digitalization in, in 1999. But uh, as you see, uh, this was with technology, the digital technology of that time. Uh, did not allow us to, to have the standards uh, that we have today. Everything was put on CD-ROM and uh, we used 16-bit uh, and 44.1 uh, kilohertz sampling rate and so on. Uh, this is different now. Today we are in the middle of a new uh, digitalization uh, campaign and this is uh, the standard that we use today. Maybe, maybe Brecht is going to speak about this uh, this afternoon, yes. So I don't go too deep into this, but, but uh, VIA is, is what Brecht is going to speak uh, uh, about this afternoon. So we are connection, in connection with them and they are in connection with the service uh, provider who then does uh, the digitalization. So I don't go uh, too deep in, in these uh, <coughs> steps. So uh, the third thing I wanted to talk about is uh, what about uh, today and tomorrow? Uh, we are confronted with um, new challenges with multimedia. It has been mentioned uh, before. Much of the music uh, production today, what, what composers do, what musicians do, is actually in connection with other media. So the, Audio as such is, is one thing, but, but it is connected. And especially if you, if you deal with interactive uh, systems and with improvisation, uh, this, this is uh, no longer restricted to audio alone. So we are here confronted with, with, uh, with the huge uh, challenges of how, how to do this. And maybe I shift to the next uh, slide. So the audio digitalization is one aspect and of course context goes along with the musical audio we have photos films letters concert announcements and so on and this uh, epam avant-garde music production fits fits well with the european context in which governments supported the autonomy of the liberal arts at the time but to understand this music i think you have to situate it within the as a post-war phenomenon. Um, actually, uh, if you look at it, um, many of these studios started early 60s and they ended, let's say, in the 80s. And that period is uh, actually fits very well with the, f with the rise and the fall of the Berlin Wall. And from, according to me, this is no, not uh, just a, a coincidence. It, it, it is this kind of context that you have to take into account. Uh, you, you have to think, why does government support that kind of music? Nowadays, nobody is interested uh, in it anymore. And maybe this is a bold statement, but, but it, it is actually what we experience uh, today. Maybe young people will, will get interest in it, but they will need the context in order to, uh, let's say, to... to um, to be able to, to make this equation true, namely that context, so the, the, digital, the, the digitalized heritage needs context in order to be able to recreate the ideal uh, heritage. Nowadays, uh, we are a research lab in, in what we call embodied uh, music cognition. So we, we deal with music, but very much from the viewpoint of human uh, embodiment and we have about uh, 20 to 30 researchers uh, with a focus on computational methods and empirical uh, methods to, to see how people interact with, with music. And we have a lot of, um, we produce nowadays a lot of uh, demonstrators. Um, that, that means uh, things with technology that show the interactive and, and that, that use an interactive environment. And what we see in the production of artistic work actually is that they use the same kind of technology as we use in building uh, demonstrators. And um, <coughs> sorry. And um, 
in this production of artist, artistic work, we have now students from the uh, conservatory who do a PhD on that at the university. Since 2006, we have this PhD in the arts, and this is a very lively uh, scene. And the thing there is that basically there is no distinction anymore between archiving art applications and archiving scientific applications. This is a very interesting development, I believe. Um, artistic work involves interactive systems and installations, having many, many components in common with what scientists use in their demonstrators and applications. Of course, scientific work is, is already documented in uh, paper publications, but uh, often I have the feeling this is not enough in order to uh, to be able to see also that uh, kind of work, we have to expand, let's say, the um, archiving uh, business also to this uh, domain. Just to give you uh, one, this was one example of an installation that was built that you could interact with virtual non-existing objects in in, a, in a space, but uh, somehow these objects are then projected on the ground and on a wall so that uh, somehow you, you can get an idea of where they are positioned in that uh, space. But recently we, we built a bigger uh, installation, and let's see if this video works. Uh, it's actually a, a a social game, a billiard, carambol billiard, that produces uh, music through interaction with uh, the system. And so the question is how to, uh, how to archive such kind of thing. <laughs> we are confronted with here are very similar to, to the questions uh, we are confronted with if we deal only with uh, audio, but uh, how, do you, how do you have to archive this? What do you want to, to do at the end with the archived information? Uh, is it, uh, should it be necessary that you are, um, no, um, would it be, should it be possible that you are able to reconstruct the installation as it was or, or how to deal with it, because the technologies that we are using here, they become very, uh, very rapidly old-fashioned. In, in a couple of years, this is old-fashioned uh, technology. Now, this is an artistic work, and actually the same thing happens with um, more recent uh, scientific work but that we see in this uh, video. It's in French. 
Depuis 2007, le département de musicologie de l'université de Gand se penche sur la question, réalisant différentes expériences. Aujourd'hui dans le hall des sports, les chercheurs tentent de voir si le rythme de la musique modifie celui du coureur. Le tempo de la musique entraîne le coureur et donc il va adapter le rythme de sa course à la musique. And uh, this uh, this is work uh, we we do that for several years, and we have built different uh, demonstrators. And I, I think for the generations that come, it is of interest to know how how this technology developed to to the state uh, that we have uh, today. And so also for that, we need actually um, a policy of how to archive these different uh, states. Of course, we rewrite papers, but uh, it's better, according to me, to, to have a, a policy of multimedia uh, archiving. So, um, so I see these uh, similarities between art and, and uh, science, and to, to give uh, one idea of how things uh, could uh, develop, I give this example, which was the result of a PhD uh, thesis on sound art, And sound art, uh, I think everybody has seen that. It could be uh, outside here in the park that you see an, a kind of sculpture that produces uh, sound. Just the wind comes in and it, produ it does something with the wind or, or you, you have to speak in, into it or something, whatever. But, but uh, there are many uh, types of sound art installations, and this was a, an attempt to, to develop a taxonomy. Uh, and this was based on, about, uh, on, on the analysis of about uh, 200 uh, different uh, sound art uh, installations, and this taxonomy was built in a kind of uh, reiterative uh, process. So you start typically with a, with a small number, and then you try to find the criteria that define these works, <clears throat> but then you add new works and you have to adapt your, your criteria. And so at, at, at the end we come up with some 13 uh, criteria that are uh, listed here, but that can actually be, um, so if you take for example, um, just uh, take this one, it does, has the piece an open form? Ah, no, it has a beginning and an ending, so that's not really an open form. Ah, it has a beginning but no ending, or it has even no beginning and no ending. Uh, these are three uh, specifications of this open uh, form uh, uh, criterion, and the whole thing can be represented uh, like this. So you see uh, open form is here, and you have here the three different uh, uh, possibilities, and sound sculptures would have uh, these two um, on, and number one, it, it has a beginning and an ending, is, is not taken into the definition of sound uh, sculpture. Okay? And you can compare this kind of uh, classification then with sound installations, which were considered here a different, as a different category, so you see that different fields are marked, and you can even calculate uh, the difference. So, so this resembles a little bit uh, what uh, at, at, at all the times um, uh, Sachs and von Hornbostel did with classification of music instruments, for example, but it, it is a way to Say to, to start with from the viewpoint of, uh, of uh, archiving also. So the future, in my opinion, goes very much into uh, multimedia. And uh, we recently uh, formed a consortium at our university with uh, other laboratories uh, in, in multimedia engineering, sociology, Uh, 3D audio engineering and video monitoring <coughs> and analysis. And we bring all our laboratories together in one super 
let's say, a media uh, lab that, that we are currently uh, building in, in a new uh, site, a new building that, that is devoted to media, media uh, work. And it looks uh, like, uh, like this, and this is uh, how it looks um, now, more or less. So they are still build, building it, and in beginning of next year it will, it will be uh, ready. And we will have a, a big uh, new laboratory inside this uh, new thing. And it also, it's also connected with an older building that, uh, that uh, we see here. So these two buildings are next uh, to each other. It, it will house about, uh, I think, 500 researchers in, in media. And, and one part of it uh, will be devoted to uh, archiving uh, also. So the conclusion, um, preservation of an existing archive, we delegated to let's say, an institute that is now specialized in it and that has a national organization that is embedded within the national uh, organization. So Brecht is going to speak about this. And uh, what we are concerned with basically is how we can upgrade this existing archive with context. That, that's from a, from a musical, musicological point of view, that's the main uh, our main focus and also we have to find new solutions for installation arts and also for the scientific work uh, that uh, we do and one of the things there is to consider the role of um, embodied interactions by audience how are we going to archive uh, this uh, what will be the aim of the future of the archives of uh, multimedia uh, in the future? Is, is it uh, to be able to reconstruct the whole thing or this, this is uh, <clears throat> yeah, something that we have to think about. Um, we also have to consider entirely new approaches based on, on 3D recordings uh, in video, in audio, in motion capture. So this, this is the the new challenge that we see, and I think that the work on audio archiving is, that has been done so far is very important in order to be able to expand it uh, to the future. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.